Now, let's get one thing quite clear. I most definitely told you. You did not. Yes, I did. You did not. Yes, I did. No, this isn't an argument. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. It's just contradiction. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It is not. It is! Okay, so if that's not an argument, then what is? A child complaining to a parent about the unfairness of their bedtime? Maybe. Two teenagers nitpicking about which Star Wars trilogy is better? Hardly. A married couple shouting over family problems loud enough for the neighbors to hear? Definitely. A televised presidential debate? Because the question is, is the question Supreme is, just this the radical question, left. Would you who shut is your, up, man? Listen, who is Debatable. Plenty of real-world commonplace examples come to mind when we think of arguments. But what constitutes a good argument? The truth is that defining an argument is a nearly impossible task. But if that's the case, how do we go about understanding something so abstract and complex? The answer lies in the way we make sense of the most abstract, complex, and if we're honest, overwhelming things we think about every day. We use metaphors. In the opening paragraph of their groundbreaking book, Metaphors We Live By, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson write, Metaphor is, for most people, a device of the poetic imagination and the rhetorical flourish, a matter of extraordinary rather than ordinary language. Moreover, metaphor is typically viewed as a characteristic of language alone, a matter of words rather than thought or action. For this reason, most people think they can get along perfectly well without metaphor. We have found, on the contrary, that metaphor is pervasive in everyday life, not just in language, but in thought and action. Our ordinary conceptual system, in terms of which we both think and act, is fundamentally metaphorical in nature. It's true, when most of us think about metaphors, we remember what we learned in English classes. Comparing two unlike things without using like or as is a typical definition memorized by kids. Eventually, we learn to zero in on creative metaphors when reading literature. Take for example one of the most famous literary metaphors from Shakespeare. All the world's a stage, and the men and women merely players. But Lakoff and Johnson are getting at something more foundational and profound. And metaphors are intrinsic to how we understand, think about, and talk about the world. I consider two overarching categories of metaphors Lakoff and Johnson discuss orientational metaphors and structural metaphors. Orientational metaphors give an abstract concept a spatial orientation. Consider these metaphors with common sayings we use to express them. Happy is up, sad is down. Health and life is up, sickness and death is down. More is up, less is down. Structural metaphors, on the other hand, connect a concept to something more concrete, easily understood and talked about. Prime examples include, time is money. You should spend your time more wisely. That was a waste of time. We need to budget our time. Life is a journey. Where do you see yourself going in life? Maybe I'll see her again down the road. Where I came from made me who I am. Mind is a machine. I can see the gears in your head turning. Her mind can store up a lot of information. He's having a mental breakdown. Most of these structural metaphors are positive, or at least neutral, in their connotation. But there is one that is distinctly and undeniably negative. Argument. Because argument is war. Consider the typical language we use when talking about arguments. You can't defend your claims. He attacked every weakness in my argument. Her criticisms were right on target. I destroyed his case. I need a better strategy. I was outflanked in that last debate. But most importantly, I won. They lost. Unquestionably, the argument as war metaphor dominates our understanding of arguments on both a personal level and on a broad public scale. It's tempting to dismiss implications of this metaphor with either a it can't be that bad or it's always been this way malaise. But such attitudes fail to account for the very real yet often overlooked consequences of this metaphorical framing of argument. 
Daniel H. Cohen, professor of philosophy at Colby College, explains, In the end, dialogues framed by the argument as war metaphor require winners and losers. There is, accordingly, a price to be paid in terms of casualties. In this case, the personal humiliation suffered by the vanquished. There are also potential costs to be paid by the other side, by the winners, who are regularly successful disputants. These are much easier to overlook. Victory can be intoxicating, and its effect can be further magnified by the nearly irresistible positive reinforcement of the full range of rewards. There is a clear message here, and is not the officially stated one. Insight and understanding are nice, of course, but if you want to get ahead, cleverness and rhetorical dexterity are what really matter in life. The result may well not just be able arguers, but argumentative arguers, proficient, pedantic, and petty. Considering Cohen wrote these words in 1995, his point here is astonishingly prophetic for our modern era, in which arguing has become ubiquitous and wildly accessible thanks to the internet and social media. The proficient, pedantic, and petty arguers Cohen is describing here, in albeit exceedingly polite language, are practically synonymous with online trolls. It's in trolls, and the interconnected technologies that spawned them, that we see the argument is war metaphor run amok most clearly. The goal of trolling is to antagonize, sabotage, and annihilate people and arguments that are seen as opponents. It is argument as war fought guerrilla style. As Cohen contends more recently, trolls' presence does not enhance argumentation. Their purposes are their own, and their contributions generally do not make a positive contribution to the argumentation. What makes their presence particularly toxic is that by taking advantage of the anonymity allowed by forums, they can enter and undermine arguments from within an argument, without thereby becoming part of the argument. A study conducted by Aaron Buckles of the University of Manitoba determined the dominant personality traits of online trolls. The results were frightening, although not necessarily surprising, as participants who self-identified as trolls scored high in the so-called dark tetrad of traits, which include Machiavellianism, narcissism, psychopathy, and sadism. While trolls fortunately comprise a relatively small percentage of the internet using population, their influence, however, is disproportionately immense, either leaving a wake of bloodied victims or adversely influencing otherwise reasonable people into arguing in the same radical warlike manner. Either outcome only serves to perpetuate the damage and harm the quality of well-intentioned good faith arguments. A variety of ideas have been proposed as solutions to the problem of internet trolling, but they don't get to the root cause of the issue. The structural metaphor argument is war. If we're going to be better, more humane arguers, we need to develop and implement new metaphors for argument. Perhaps the most viable alternative to argument as war is argument as construction, in part because construction is already part of our metaphorical lexicon. We use expressions like building an argument, or we make a foundational point. But this metaphor extends beyond just how we talk about arguments to how we view people we're arguing with. Within the framework of construction, argument is not a competitive enterprise, it's a cooperative one. It's possible, and helpful, to imaginatively conceive of argument as building a bridge, with two arguers starting at opposite sides of a chasm and meeting in the middle. Perhaps after the bridge is built, one arguer changes their mind and decides to go live on the opposite side from where they started, or they may remain unpersuaded and choose to go back to where they began. In either scenario, there is now a cooperatively constructed bridge which allows for the peaceful sharing of ideas and perspectives. Another alternative metaphor proposed by Dr. Harriet Lerner is argument as dance, in which arguers learn the steps of an argument in the same manner as dancers learn the steps of a routine. The end goal is a back-and-forth exchange that develops connection and relationship. Maybe embracing metaphors like these can begin to change how we argue and why we argue in the first place. Of course, some people may think that if we abandon argument as war, then we're just giving away the farm and letting the trolls win. If we don't fight them, they'll become more powerful and make our lives more miserable. 
This reaction is understandable, but it's also coming from a place of fear. The fear that if we don't defend ourselves and strategically counterattack, then we'll be destroyed somehow. It plays into the hands of the old myth that fighting violence with violence produces peace. But if we can liberate ourselves from the fear that the war metaphor plants in our hearts and minds, uh, what power do the trolls really have left? The fog of war is an expression used to describe the uncertainty of military combatants regarding one's own capability and objective, enemy capability and enemy intent. So, if we view ourselves and others as combatants, as enemies, when in the midst of an argument, what kind of fog might we lose ourselves in? Or will we have the courage to step out of the fog of war and into the light of peace? So, obviously, this video is an argument, and I'm trying to persuade you to a new worldview, a new perspective on arguing. And if I've been successful, then most people would assume that I was the winner of the argument. But I have to ask, what does that even really mean? What do I really even gain out of winning? A uh, round of applause, pat on the back, gold star for being a good arguer. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that I don't really gain anything, especially anything intellectually, from being the winner of this argument. In fact, I would say that you're the winner. You're the one who has emerged with something new, a, a new perspective, a new worldview, or at the very least, a more nuanced perspective. Yeah, you're the winner. And that's a good thing. So, good luck arguing, and thanks for watching.